Good evening, church. Our Bible reading this evening comes from Esther chapter 9. Esther chapter 9. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews, because fear of Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Pashandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aradatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aradai, and Vasatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those slain in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on gallows. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they hanged the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa three hundred men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. The Lord's Word. We are almost getting to the end of Esther, um, so we will have one more on Esther and then we'll be done. And from there, after school holidays, as you know, we always take a break in school holidays and do something a bit different. We're going to be looking at the book of James. James is a very practical book. It's a very easy book and uh, there's some wonderful passages in James, so you can do some reading ahead of time. Of course, I know you're going to read through the book of James ahead of time, so that when we come, you're all prepared and ready and waiting and bawling me up after the service saying, are you sure about that? Let's pray together. Your word declares to us, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We know that things are only accomplished if they are fueled by the power of the Spirit. And so we acknowledge this evening 
that not only is the preaching of your word dependent upon the Spirit's power, but so is the receiving of your word. And we ask that as we bring ourselves in submission to your word, that we might hear what you have to say to us, that we might listen carefully to your voice, and that you would enable us not to leave here simply having been informed or gained a greater understanding of this passage, but rather that we will leave here knowing what kinds of changes need to take place in our lives, and that you would help us to diligently apply your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. In the third installment of The Lord of the Rings that I'm sure many of you have seen, some of you may not have seen it, but in the third installment of The Lord of the Rings, a novel written by Tolkien, which really has a spiritual element to it when he wrote it, uh, there's the scene near the end of the movie where the city that the good forces are defending is under attack, and they are vastly outnumbered. And it looks like the balance of the battle is going to turn on this uh, outnumbered forces, and they're going to lose. The city has been broken into, the gates have tumbled, and these horrible creatures called orcs are beginning to invade. And then, out of nowhere, you see the stream of ghost-like figures enter into the battle. And what you discover is that these ghost-like appearances of people is a vast army that have been in this intermediate state of not quite having been dead, the undead dead, if that makes sense to you. And as a result of a vow they broke many, many hundreds of years prior, they are now going to fulfill this vow that they broke so that they may die and have rest. And so they enter into this battle in their hordes, and the whole momentum is changed. And these forces that were being defeated now gain the upper hand, and there is a complete and total rout. This is what happens here. The Jews are outnumbered, way outnumbered in this kingdom. Outnumbered probably at a ratio of nine to one. And from a human perspective, the prospects of them prevailing if the entire nation is raised up and the entire nation descends upon them, are not great. When I did national service, we were always told that when you go into a battle, in a conventional battle, the way you go in is a three-to-one ratio. You should have three times the amount of soldiers as the enemy. This is a complete reversal of that. And yet in spite of the minority of the Jews, they prevail. And the author is at pains to show you how the sway of public opinion has transferred from the evil and from Haman who is being executed onto the side of the Jews that are now mainly supported by the population. Nine months has transpired since the second edict was issued and since Haman was hung on the gallows. And the reader cannot fail to see and must not fail to see that all of this is a result of the hand of God. If all you read into the story is the prevailing of the Jews over the Persians and the other nations that have been captured by Persia, you read it wrong. What the author is trying to say, he's in a sense screaming out to you, 
See the hand of God. See how God has turned the situation upside down. See how God has turned the tables. See how God has given the Jews a favorable disposition in this nation. See how God has been working in the background these past nine months. See how God has raised them to prominence. See how God has ensured their deliverance. See God at work behind the scenes. It's unmistakable. And not to see that is to misread the passage. It is a total rout because God's power causes his enemies to be utterly defeated. When you stand and when the enemies of God stand against him and when they shake their fist in his face, it may seem from a human perspective that they prevail, particularly in the human affairs of the world. It may sometimes seem that they have the upper, the upper hand. But make no mistake, the battle has already been won. And one day, when the Lord Jesus Christ appears, that victory will be an evidence for all to see. And the scriptures declare to us, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is not a battle that is hanging in the balance this is a battle that has already been won. Now, firstly, I want you to notice that God's power, because this is all about God, God's power is irresistible. Verses 1 to 5. God's power is irresistible. Let me read the text. On the 19th day of the 12th month, of the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. Hear the language. But now, the tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. Hear the language. The Jews assembled in their cities and in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. Now listen, no one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. What caused that fear? And, now there's another and added to this, all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the kings, administrators, helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. Now that does not scream to you God's power at work in the background, not only raising Mordecai to prominence because there's been nine months, not only raising him to a position of power, but causing all these nations gathered in Persia whom Persia had conquered to fear the Jews so much to the point at which they rally around them and they support them and they help them. Coupled to all of that, you have the king's administrators, the governors, the satraps of all these provinces scattered throughout this great Persian empire who are also in fear and who also side along the Jews and they give them whatever they need in order for them to prevail in the battle. God's power is irresistible. What is also clear in this is the fact that in, the, in spite of the support that these Jews are now receiving from many within the nation, there is still a group that hates them. 
There is still a group that will rise up against them. There is still a group that they will have to defend themselves against. The very fact that they have to defend themselves is the author's way of reminding us of how easily and quickly sin has the power to corrupt an entire nation. One man stands up. One man goes to the king. One man says to the king, let an edict be issued that on this day in the 12th month, all the Jews get destroyed. And an entire nation is affected by that one man's sin. So that in spite of the spate of time that is elapsed between the issuing of the second edict, which is now nine months ago, there is still a portion of this population who hate and despise the Jews. The power of sin to corrupt people is unmistakable in this text. It reveals how sin can cause absolute blindness in people. Is that not, in fact, what Jesus himself brings to the surface? That people are blinded by their sin. That in order for them to understand the gospel, what needs to happen? God, by his word and through the Spirit, must shine light upon them. And it's only through the light of the gospel that people's sin is lifted, that the blindness is taken. Why do you think, dear friends, you struggle so much to help people to understand the gospel? It's because sin has blinded them. Sin has caused them that, to be plunged into darkness. And sin drives them. And sin distorts their understanding. And so the gospel comes into this darkness and it shines a penetrating light that exposes the darkness and brings the gospel to bear upon it. But I want you to understand something else here that is very important. It's very easy for a nation to be corrupted by sin. If you spoke to a German Back in 1933, when Hitler came to power as a, the chancellor with all those policies that he instituted, and you said to a German man or woman, in another 12 years' time, you would be responsible to have killed 6 million Jews. They would have stepped back in horror one of the most cultured societies in the world, one of the most technologically advanced societies in the world, one of the most refined societies in the world, became responsible through the power of one man to influence an entire nation, caused six million Jews to lose their lives in horrific circumstances, and another 50-odd million to be killed in the Second World War. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you, my dear friends, be very careful who you put in power of a nation. Be very careful. Notice how the author reminds us here of how the Jews are able to defend themselves with absolute freedom. No one is inhibiting them. No one is stopping them. They are able to ensure that as they are attacked by these people who have still are bent on destroying them, that there are no officials who come to them and say, you can't do that. In fact, the officials of the city get behind them. They have free reign. This is a complete reversal of the edict that was issued by Haman in chapter 3, verse 11. And it points to the power behind the Jews. In nine months, 
God has been at work, slowly changing attitudes, slowly ensuring that the majority of the population are influenced so that the bulk of them support and get behind the Jews. So that when the attack occurs, there's a total rout because God's power is irresistible. And it's important for us to understand that because it is the irresistibility of God's power that will ensure that in the end God prevails, that God's purposes in this world will be accomplished. There is no nation in this world, there is no person in this world, no matter how much power they may have or is invested in them, that can ever ultimately prevent God from accomplishing all he sets out to accomplish. Now that's at the grand scale of this world. God is not threatened by nations that oppose him. God is not intimidated by leaders that shake their fist in his face because he will have the final say. Job chapter 42 Verse 2 declares, I know, this is Job, and this is Job answering God, I know that you can do all th things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Proverbs 21.30. There's so many, I've only picked out two. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Do you hear that? Now, if you are a believer here this evening, you should take great comfort in that. Because you must see and you must understand that God's power will ensure that every single purpose He has purposed for you will be absolutely accomplished. No one can thwart those purposes. No one can prevent God from doing what He has determined to do in your life. For he is sovereign. And this great display of God's power is meant to also foreshadow the display of power that God is going to demonstrate in an act that will happen in the future when he raises his son from the dead. Because nothing can prevent Jesus from being raised from the dead. He will be raised. No evil plan of man or the Jews or the Romans who give legality to the death of Jesus on that cross can prevent it from happening. That same power that enabled the Jews to defend themselves is at work when God exerts his mighty power to raise Jesus from the dead. Hear the word of God. I pray Ephesians 1.18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory, inheritance in his saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now here, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realm, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and that every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the age to come. That mighty power that was exerted in raising Christ from the dead. Now there's another implication of this. An even greater implication, I think, when we think in terms of God's power. And that is that same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you as a believer. Here again, the word of God. I pray, Ephesians, 4, verse, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you, same word as what you used early in Ephesians, Ephesians, that he may strengthen you with power in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
Here is God saying that power that was exerted in raising Jesus from the dead is the power that is given to you as a believer so that you may experience the fullness of the life of Jesus Christ in you. The problem why we sometimes don't access that power is because we lose the connection between us and God through our own sinfulness. Just recently, I was mowing the lawn and really just to mow up leaves from tree that had fallen in the back lawn. It just keeps pouring down, and the only way to do it quickly and efficiently is to use the lawn mower. I'm certainly not going to spend hours raking it. And as I was pushing the lawnmower, I hit an object that had been left out on the lawn, um, and I stopped the mower, removed the object, and then started it up again, and the lawnmower started, and as I pushed it, the power was just not there. It was just as if something had happened. And so I stopped it, and I pulled it again, thinking maybe I'm running out of petrol. And it started up, it sounded fine, and then it went back to this low power that was hardly doing anything. So I opened the petrol tank. I mean, that's logical, isn't it? Is there petrol? And there was petrol. So I pulled it up again, and I thought maybe something stuck, and I turned it over, and I had a look underneath, and there was nothing stuck. So I pulled the start again. It started up normally, and then as I started pushing, the power just dipped to this hardly moving. So I stopped and I thought, right, logically analyze this. What is the problem? You've got a power problem. What is it maybe caused by? Petrol? No, not by petrol. Is it spark plug? No, it's not spark. The spark plug is new. So what's the other problem? Throttle, right? It's logical. So I looked at the throttle, went down to the bottom, and one of the springs had come off the throttle that causes you to get the extra power you need. And when I reattached that spring and started it up, the lawn mows back to normal. Have you lost connection with God? Have you? How's your relationship with Him going? That power that raised Christ from the dead that God has given you to live out your Christianity, that incredible power you have access to, Is it flowing in and through and out? Is it? That irresistible power. Are you experiencing that in your walk with the Lord? Or are you like that lawnmower, spluttering and starting in fits and starts because you've neglected your relationship with Jesus? There are no shortcuts. There just aren't. Secondly, God's power is comprehensive. Look at verses 6 to 50. I'm not going to read the verses for the sake of time. God's power is comprehensive. What I want you to see, and well done for reading those names, Martin. I'm glad you did it. I'm not going to try and reread them unless you'd like to reread them for us, but you did a good job. But when you read about the, in verses 6 to 15, what you see is that first the description of the victory is described in Susa because Susa is one of the main cities, one of the capital cities. And so it's described how the Jews succeed there. But then you see it moving out to all the other cities so that there's a comprehensive nature of the victory that is here. It is so comprehensive that it spreads throughout the entire kingdom. And it then is mentioned that the ten sons of Haman are killed. Why does he mention that? Why why is that important? Well, it's important because they symbolize the opposition to the Jews. Like their father, they hated the Jews. Like their father, they engaged in the battle. And like their father, they ended up being slaughtered. They ended up with their lives being taken from them. And it underscores the the nature of this battle between God and this nation that serve pagan gods. Why? Because when you trace the names of those sons that are mentioned, which are so difficult to pronounce, they are probably all names of pagan gods or demons. So there's another battle at stake here. 
And the fact that they've been crushed because it underscores their evil nature and their cultic affiliation is a way in which God is saying, I have triumphed over the gods. I have prevailed. These gods that these Persians serve, these gods that are symbolized in the names of uh, Haman's son, they are nothing before me. I am the only true God. And they cannot resist me. He has prevailed. It is total victory. This is further emphasized in the petition of Esther. Notice now it is the king who initiates. What happened last time? Esther initiates. Now the king initiates. And he says to Esther, is there anything else you want? Now, according to the character of the king, it's consistent as Pastor Nathan has pointed out repeatedly in our series. He cares nothing for his people. 75,000 dead. He doesn't even blink an eye. Who cares? My people are dead. Nothing to intervene in these nine months. Nothing to dissuade his people from attacking the Jews. No campaign to say, listen, desist from whatever you thought you wanted to do. No, he just gets on with his drinking and eating. And he's reveling in the palace with all the women. And when 75,000, think about that, 75,000 lie dead. He couldn't care less. It's consistent with who he is. Esther asked for one more day so that the sons of Haman may be hanged. Now, it's not that they're being killed, that they're being hanged. Why does she want them hanged from the gallows? Well, probably because it would be a graphic reminder to the entire nation, not only the people of Susa, but because this would have got out and spread around the nation, that if you oppose God's people, this is what happens. You end up dead. And it would have provided a reason for them not to oppose the Jews in the future. It's there for all the public to see. And this section just reminds us that there is no place in the kingdom where God's power is not on display. It is absolutely comprehensive. And that is a wonderful reminder to you and I, is it not? That when we live in a world where Christians are undoubtedly in the minority, I said this morning, for those of you who are here, that Christianity is the most persecuted Christ, uh, religion in the world today. More Christians lose their lives today than any other religion in the world. In a world that is primarily anti-God, there is no Christian nation in this world. And if you take the percentages, it would be interesting to see with the latest census, census when the information is available what's happened between this one and the last one. But if you look at all the censuses that have been before, there is a shrinking number of people who declare themselves to be Christian, in inverted commas. In a world where secular ethics prevail, in a world where unbelieving ethics prevail, in a world where Christians are constantly fighting and swimming upstream, remember... That God is in control. Remember that God has not lost control. Remember that every unbeliever falls under the comprehensive power of God. And they can only do what God's power permits them to do. God says to every unbeliever, your life is in the palm of my hands. And God has the ability to bring it to an end whenever he chooses. And God brings nations down. God causes nations to fall when they choose to repeatedly rebel against him even though they may not be his people. You see this in 
Habakkuk, you see it in Micah, you see it in Joel, where God warns the surrounding nations and he rebukes and he brings judgment to bear as he was going to do with Persia. Eventually, Persia would fall. And there would be a complete annihilation. And what that reminds you and I of at a personal level, and it's really important for you to see this, is that whatever pressure you're under, whatever threats you may face, your life is in the palm of Almighty God. He's got you covered. You're under his power. You're under his authority. The very existence of our lives are in the hands of God. No one will take your life too early. You won't live a day longer than what God has determined and a day shorter. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. In, a heart, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Romans 14, 12. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Yes, the unbeliever may seemingly prevail, but even their lives are in the hands of Almighty God. Sometimes we talk about accidents. We talk about unforeseen circumstances, and from a human perspective, that's what they are, things that happen to us that we haven't planned, that happen what we might say per chance, but in God's economy, there's nothing by chance. And God's power is of such a nature that it, are, it, it is over you and over everyone else, and he is orchestrating and working out his plans. Let me give you a great example of this. And I think I might have shared this in the morning service. So some of you in the morning service might remember this. This is a true story. A pastor was working late on a Sunday night at the Almighty God Tabernacle. That was the name of the church, the Almighty God Tabernacle. At around 10 p.m., he decided to call his wife before he left for home. Although the pastor let the phone ring several times, his wife didn't answer. A few moments later, he tried again, and she answered right away. He asked her why she hadn't answered before, and she said that the phone didn't ring. The following Monday, he received a call at the church office. The caller wanted to know why the pastor had called him Saturday night. The pastor was confused. The caller said it rang and rang, but I didn't answer. Then the pastor remembered the incident and apologized for disturbing him, explaining that he had intended to call his wife and must have dialed the wrong number. The man said, that's okay, let me tell you my story. You see, I was planning to commit suicide that night. But before I did, I prayed, God, if you're there, and if you don't want me to do this, Give me a sign right now. He said, at that moment, my phone started to ring. I looked at the caller ID, and it said, Almighty God. <laughs> I was just too afraid to answer. Isn't that incredible? A misplaced phone call with the name of the church, Almighty God, on it, turns up on a caller ID of a man who's about to commit suicide, who's desperately cried out to God. Do you get it? God's got your life under his control. And then thirdly, very quickly, God's power invokes joy. God's power invokes joy. Look at verses 16 to 19. I will read those. Those are only three verses. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. 
They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. The authors at pains to emphasize they did not take the plunder. This happened on the 13th month of the day of Adar, and on the 14th month they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. Verse 18. The Jews of Susa, however, assembled on the 13th and 14th day, and then on the 15th day they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews... Those living in the villages observe the 14th of the month of Adar as the day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Do you get it? Do you see see how the the result of God's intervention on behalf of his people and God's power working in the background, the end result of that is a people who rejoice, is the celebration, is the starting of the Purim, and which is a, an explanation why Jews celebrate Purim, which wasn't one of the official feasts that God instituted, but one that is la- later added by the Jews precisely because they want to celebrate, they want to remember with great joy the way that God delivered them. And it is this deliverance that inspires this joy because they serve a God who is not so de- detached from them, that he doesn't intervene in their affairs and doesn't rescue them and is not got, uh, who, who's not watching over them, but they serve a God who is intimately engaged in every part of their lives and understands the plight that they're in, understands the danger that they are exposed to, and then intervenes in a way in the background by delivering them from their enemies and by rescue them, rescuing them from all their foes. And so the end result of that is we have a celebration, we have joy, and the gifts that they give to each other, probably part of that would have involved food so that there's no one in Israel who goes without. All of them participate. So let me pause you there for a moment and ask you this, when you think about the deliverance that is won by God here, what does that remind you of thinking forward? What does that foreshadow? Does it not foreshadow the deliverance that we receive when we come to Christ and we are taken out of darkness into light and the burden of our sin is taken off our shoulders and laid on the Lord Jesus Christ and we are delivered from the shackles of Satan. We are delivered from the kingdom of Satan. We are taken out of his kingdom and brought into the kingdom of God. And now, once we were who were slaves of Satan, who jumped at every woman fancy of Satan, now are called the children of God, and we have are able to call God our Father. Is that not the greatest deliverance of all? That God should rescue us from ourselves, rescue us from our sins by sending Christ to die on the cross and take our place. Who bears our penalty, who bears our sin, and who offers deliverance from Satan, deliverance from sin. And who is powerfully raised from the dead as God's means of vindicating him, of God's means of saying his work is accepted by me on the cross. And then offers eternal life to all without distinction. Ought that not to cause us to break out with great joy? Ought not that to cause us to celebrate? even in the most darkest of times, that whatever else is going on in our lives, whatever difficulties we may be experiencing right now, thank God we have eternal life and have been delivered from our sin, rescued from the clutches of evil because of the work of Christ on the cross. Is that not always an occasion for celebration? an occasion for joy, and when we see the power of God at work in Christ, and we see the power of God removing our sin by punishing his own son on the cross, when we see the power of God at work in raising Christ from the dead, 
does that not enable us to face the future with great confidence, knowing that when death comes tapping on our shoulders, that we will be delivered into the presence of God for all eternity. No wonder Christians should be joyful because we have a joy that is not dependent upon our circumstances but dependent on the finished work of Christ and that is eternal. And so we are told that even Jesus on that cross, I love this verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, even Jesus on the cross, let us fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. There is Jesus suffering on our behalf, but there's joy in Jesus because he knows what he's accomplishing. Your and my salvation on that cross. And if the Son of God is able to express joy knowing that he is going to rescue a multitude that no one can number, ought not you and I to be people of joy because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for the incredible display of power in Jesus. We thank you that you are the one who works out your sovereign purposes for our lives. And every purpose you have determined will be accomplished. Thank you that there is no one, no power, no person, no authority that can thwart your purposes. All that you set out to do will be accomplished. And when all your plans have come to fruition, and all your work has been done, we know that Christ will return and set up his eternal kingdom. Until then, we pray that you would help us to be people who are filled with joy and an inexpressible joy for the salvation of our souls. For you have performed in us the greatest rescue of all by delivering us from the kingdom of evil into the kingdom of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you. Amen. Let's stand and sing.